You're watching The Isaiah Factor, Uncensored. And welcome back to the second half hour of The Factor Uncensored. Now, for decades, churches have had influence on political choices and social justice. However, things become heated near and around election times. Now, the debate thickens if your church should only be a place of worship or if it's okay to endorse and invite political candidates. Who do we have with us? Dave Welch, who is with the Houston Area Pastors Council, Pastor Alan Lamar Patterson with Mount Corinth, and State Representative Ron Reynolds. And I brought you guys together to talk about the issue of religion and politics. The question is, you know, we're in the election season. Should politics play a role in the church? Should you talk about politics in the church? Dave, let's begin with you. Well, look, in, it was said in uh, one, of, one of our founding fathers that in a country such as this, uh, religion is as part of politics. And what that really means is that we're not to leave our faith at the door when we leave the church building. We're to walk out our faith in all parts of our life. And as American citizens, we have a responsibility to participate, and that includes the exercise of our faith when we vote. So I think it's an integral part of doing it well, doing it right, and doing it faithfully. Pastor Patterson, do you agree with that? I absolutely agree with it. The Word of God says, you know, that the church, the ecclesia, is not a building, but it's actually a group of believers. And if you look in the Gospels and the Gospel of Matthew, uh, he tells us very clearly we're to season society with salt. We are to shine with society to get them to see with sight. So we're to season them. He says, be the salt of the earth. He didn't say be the salt of the church, a building. He says the entirety of the earth, I need you to go out there and be the salt. Then he says, I need you to shine. He says, be the light of the world, like a city shining on a hill. He says, you need to infiltrate what's going on with the issues in society because he wants us to show society ultimately his scriptures, what is good, his good will, his good nature. And so that's who the church is. The Ecclesia, we've been called out. We've not been called in. We've been called to be outside the walls of the church, not just inside. So absolutely, I would definitely agree. Representative Reynolds, when we hear a separation of church and state, are we not getting that? Is that something different? Uh, is, is politics considered the state inside of the church? Well, Isaiah, I, I, I first want to say that uh, it's great to be on with the with the pastors. I'm a proud Christian person uh, myself, and, and I'm a man of faith. But I do believe that there should be a separation of church and state, as declared by Thomas Jefferson uh, in the Establishment Clause. I do believe that if we, as America, which arguably is a Christian nation, a majority of Christians, I think it gives undue influence on Christians that to the detriment of, of Muslims and Hindus and Protestants and, and the Jewish community and, and even atheists. And so while, while I do believe in Christianity, I do believe that there it should be separated from our government because the government shouldn't be in the business of trying to tell people that there is only one religion that should be espoused. I think it takes away religious freedoms and, and, it, and it goes against the founding principles uh, of our nation when, when, our, when Thomas Jefferson did the Establishment Clause back in 1802. And it has been well established for, for since then that there is a separation of church and states and it's been upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. So I do believe that if we go away with this, you're going to see more and more uh, uh, politicians like me telling Muslims, how dare you? Uh, you're, you're in violation of the law because you're not following Christian principles. You, we need to have the Ten Commandments in the school. We need to have prayer in the school. That's all gone. And, and, I, and I respect the, the separation of church and state. And uh, uh, Dave, let's bring you back into this conversation. When we have policy, and we know many politicians now go to church on Sundays to try and get that support, but do you invite everyone or do you invite 
the politician of your choice if he's coming to your church? And do you actually give an endorsement or you say, just hear this guy out and you decide? Well, first of all, you know, Representative Reynolds set up a whole series of straw men when it was wrong in almost every way. Uh, first of all, the Establishment Clause is there to protect the practice and exercises of religion from the state, not the other way around. And when you look at the concept of what has occurred through all these years, the first words in the Constitution are, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union. So the people, all of us, of all faiths and all beliefs, are citizens that have a duty to exercise those responsible those beliefs we have into our choice of leaders how the policies we exercise through those leaders and so to say you can't participate because you're a person of faith is the exact opposite of what our founding fathers said so you know that we, we use the term politics really loosely and unfortunately it's confused the whole issue what we're really talking about here is should the people participate in their governance and should people that happen to attend church on sunday and pastors who happen to preach in the pulpits on Sunday, should we exclude any act of our governance from our participation in our teaching and our preaching? And there's nothing in our history that says that at all. Uh, so I think that's an important distinction right here that we have to look at mm -hmm. and to say we don't want ignorant people voting. Uh, we want people to be well-informed. We want them to be prayerful. Uh, we want them to be inclusive. But every individual has the responsibility to say, yes, I'm a part of this. I'm doing this well and doing it faithfully according to my faith and principles. And not to use that as a say, well, by me doing it or saying I should is saying that somebody else should not. So that's just, again, a red herring. And welcome back to The Factor Uncensored. We continue our conversation about politics in the church. Uh, if if Pastor Welch or Pastor Patterson, with all due respect, if they were in their pulpit and they said, I endorse whoever, you know, John Doe for the position of blah, 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 they could lose their 501c3 status because a church cannot endorse. If they do it from the pulpit, that there have been churches that have lost their 501c3 status because it violates our uh, our rules. And so that Pastor Welsh knows that a, a church cannot endorse uh, a political candidate. If they do, then, then they can lose their 501c3 status. That That is a fact. Uh, and, and that that is undisputed. No, it's not. It certainly is disputed. Look, there's been one church, one in the history of the 501c3 that has lost its 501c3 status. One. So that's it, hip hypocritical to even say that, Representative Reynolds. And we're not even saying that pastors should endorse from the pulpit. They can. They can as an individual, not as the church unit. And nobody's saying that's the case and it should be. So at least, at least be factual in what you're saying. That's what I just said. A church cannot. The, they, no, they no, can't no say, you said the pastors can, no, can't. No, well, if the pastor says, uh, my church endorses such and such, then 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 the, the IRS will be in and, and, re and revoke. That's not even the conversation today. Go ahead, Pastor Patterson. I would just like to ask, in this experiment, of this approximately 248 years of America, which is not, a, it was not founded on Christian values. That needs to be clear, number one. But how has this experiment worked over the past 240 years? And in which direction are we going without the guidance of God? That's the question I would ask. In my lifetime, I would not say we are better off today than when I was born in 1970. It appears as though we're headed in the wrong direction. We need guidance. Everybody, every system, every formation, every, everyone and everything needs some form of guidance. And the reason why we are where we are is because of a lack of guidance. You know what the church wants? We wanna pursue purity. You know what the church wants? We wanna practice propriety. You know what the church wants? We want to protect the powerless. I think that's what Representative Reynolds would want in his district. So I think we ought to be involved. I think we need to be engaged, and maybe we can be headed in a different direction than where we're going. And Dave, let's, let's really quick, Dave, let's get back to that question I asked you earlier. Are you willing to endorse, or is it endorsing just by inviting someone to your church and not all parties that may be running for that particular spot? 
Well, look, let's look at what the what the courts have said, what the IRS says. Look, church, not all churches are 501c3, by the way. They don't have to be. But those who choose to be, there are certain parameters, and, and that they can invite candidates into their services. A lot of churches do that regularly. Yeah. Um, if they choose to invite a candidate, uh, they can pray over them. But, you know, th again, the act of, of just inviting them to participate in a, at a service or in a church is not a violation of the C3. It may not be the com comprehensive approach that I would recommend, which is, say, invite all the candidates, do a candidate forum, uh, make sure that people are well-informed. They shouldn't hear from candidates on both sides, ideally. Uh, but, again, that's not, that's not an act in itself of a violation of the C3 uh, or of any core standards. And, Pastor Patterson, <laughs> from your perspective— uh, as a black church leader, we have seen candidates come to black churches for decades when they are running for a, an office. Correct. According to this particular pastor in this article, though, uh, the Pastor Jeffries of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, the, the article says he told publicly to his congregants everything about Trump and why they should vote for Trump. So uh, at my particular church, we do not allow uh, politicians to come in uh, because we focus on the word of God mm. and, you know, get on the word. But um, it's very interesting how we can get sidetracked. Uh, like if you pastor 16,000 people in Dallas, Texas, and you're telling them that it's okay as believers to just put aside someone's personality for policy, we're headed in a very dangerous direction. And, and, and that's kind of what was going on. I don't know if you all read the article, mm -hmm. but, but that's why it's a dangerous slippery slope that, uh, that I think, I just think the word of God is priority. Uh, it stood this test of time. It stood beyond 248 years. We're going over, what? 2,000 years with Jesus Christ and the word of God and centuries before that with the Old Testament. And that's all I was saying with regards to Representative uh, Reynolds. Representative what Reynolds, you want to wrap this up here? With all due respect. I, I, agree, I agree with what Pastor Patterson is saying. I think that okay. the Pastor Jeffries went way too far. Uh, I think that that is the danger when you, from the pulpit, say, hey, you know, vote for Trump, or it could be vote for Kamala. Either one is wrong. I don't think they should do either one. I, do now, I agree with you on that. that. I do believe that Pastor Welch is, is right when a, when a church can invite a candidate. So if you invite President Trump, you know, invite Vice President Harris, then that's great. But don't endorse either candidate from the pulpit. I think that gives undue influence, and that certainly violates church and state when you go that far. To invite is to inform and is to educate, but to go and say, hey, this is the person that you need to go vote for, and 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 you are articulating, like that article stated, his reasons why he laid it out, those four bullets. I think that went way too far, and I think that he is dangerously close if he didn't violate, uh, if he had a, a 501c3, that's to the non-exempt status that most churches want to have so that people, when they make donations, they can get the, 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 the write-offs, right? If a church doesn't have a 501c3, then you can't make a, a tax-deductible donation to that church. And the church can't make uh, get things for the church that they would be tax exempt from. So it's it's a very most churches I know pastors I know a lot of them they want to have a five hundred one c three for their church. All right, Dave, uh, so why don't you wrap us up? I was going to say those four questions that you just referenced. Trump failed them all, but yet he still told the church <laughs> to follow Trump. So just thought I'd throw that in too. Well, Dave, why don't you wrap us up? Okay, well, look, if we're going to go down that road, look, uh, you know, if he's an F, then Kamala's an F minus. But let's just look at these. Let's look at the four questions. Okay, and let's look. The, the bigger picture here is, is I don't, believe, I, don't believe, I don't believe the government should tell a pastor how to how to run their church. I Are you a Trump that, supporter? I believe that religious freedom is religious freedom, and I don't, I don't, I believe a pastor should have the right to stand up in the pulpit and teach his people. Now, I don't encourage pastors to endorse candidates from the pulpits. They have the right to do so as an individual, not as a church unit typically. But here's the question, and the bigger issue is, should people who attend church of strong religious faith 
be able to carry their faith and their values and their beliefs, including those who believe in the Bible and uh, that that is the word of God, into the voting booth and say, I'm going to vote for candidates who share my faith and values. And yes, I think that's absolutely a God-given and constitutional guarantee, right? And a responsibility for us as people of faith. Did you just say Kamala Harris is worse than Trump, though? Yeah, that was those four questions. She's an F minus. That, that's yes. the hypocrisy of the. Yeah, yeah, see, that, that's that's not, that, now, this is the problem. That is, that is <laughs> such hypocrisy. Well, you said I, it first. I can't see how any Christian. <laughs> so you're the hypocrite first, and I can be hypocrite second. Oh, that's guys, that's for a different show. We want to thank you for joining <laughs> us here on the Factor on Censor, and we appreciate your time tonight. Thank you all.